1st of September, 1939, and the Polish post office in the free city of Danzig is under siege. Surrounded by SA police units and Nazi sympathizers, the Germans demand the building surrender. The outnumbered Polish staff inside make the brave decision to defy the invaders and refuse submission. In the opening hours of the Second World War, as the German army steamrolled its way into Poland and the Luftwaffe bombed whole cities into rubble, a small battle would unfold at the Danzig Polish post office. For over 15 hours, the Poles would hold out against impossible odds, spitting in the eye of the Nazi war machine, hoping for the best, but in the end, receiving the worst. The Polish post office, where this battle would unfold, was opened in 1920, being converted from an old German military hospital. After Germany's defeat in the Great War, territory was carved up by the victorious allies. West Prussia was given to the new Polish Republic, creating the narrow corridor that separated East Prussia from Germany. This was partially done as a slight against the fallen empire, but also to allow the Poles access to the Baltic Sea, giving the young nation greater economic freedom. Major trade would pass through the port of the city of Danzig. The Polish government had wanted to annex the city into its new territory, but with an overwhelming German population who demanded their right to self-determination, the fledgling League of Nations instead struck a compromise and transformed Danzig into an independent city-state. Poland was given a unique number of rights in the city over foreign affairs and economic trade, but also included creating its own post office. So in 1920, the hospital and its surrounding structures were converted, with Building 1 on Helveliusplatz becoming the primary building in 1930. It operated as a legitimate post office throughout its tenure. With over 100 employees, it delivered mail and parcels to the German and Polish population. But the office also acted as an intelligence gathering station. Informants would send vital information to military intelligence, keeping them up to date on events unfolding in the free city. Things were largely uneventful throughout the 1920s, but the Poles became increasingly concerned in 1933, when Germany left behind its broken love affair with Weimar Republicanism, and instead embraced something much more aggressively militaristic. The rise of the Nazi regime saw a wave of anti-Polish rhetoric, and by 1930, Hitler's plans to restore German honour at any cost had become painfully transparent. Another war was on the horizon, and Polish High Command knew that the post office in Danzig would be one of the first battlegrounds. So in April, they dispatched Sub-Lieutenant Konrad Gudersky to organise its defence. Gudersky took to his new charge like a professional soldier, identifying weak spots, reinforcing key locations such as the entrance, and removing obstacles that would obscure lines of sight. The post office became a training camp overnight, with the employees being drilled daily on firearm usage, hand-to-hand -hand combat, securing and holding key positions, as well as fallback points should the enemy secure a foothold in the building. A chain of command was created, with Alphonse Flisikowski, one of the civilian workers, being placed second in command. Two other postmen, Jan Mikon and Joseph Wozik, would act as sub-lieutenants. Gudersky's work was made easier by the fact that a number of the men belonged to the Polish Riflemen's Association. This ensured that some of them already had basic training. Reports were sent back between Army Intelligence and the Post Office on the progress. In August, Polish command were able to send 10 Army Reservists to bolster the building's security and aid in the training. Everything was running like clockwork, as it should in a post office but that well-run machine would soon be smashed apart. On the 1st of September, 1939, the Germans made their move. In the early morning, the building's power was cut. Forty minutes later, the battleship Schleswig-Holstein, positioned in the Danzig harbour, opened fire on the Polish garrison at Westerblatt. The men there would endure their own heroic last stand in the coming hours. Gudersky and his postman acted quickly. Weapons were handed out, mostly small firearms, and three Browning WZ 1928 machine guns, along with a number of grenades that had been smuggled into the city. Securing the building, they took up defensive positions. The Danzig police soon arrived, surrounding the building. Local SA units, along with SS Heimwehr Danzig, acted as reinforcements, bolstering the German numbers with three ADGZ armored cars. Gauleiter Albert Forster, head of the local Nazi party, arrived with them. Members of the local press were hot on Forster's heels to report the Nazi victory. It would be a quick battle, over in minutes, and make for a winning headline. Once all the men were in position, police captain Willy Bethke gave the order to attack. 
Under a haze of suppressive fire, the Germans attempted to storm the entrance, forcing their way into the building. The defenders quickly drove them back, killing two while injuring seven others. A second assault was attempted on the rear work office, breaking through the courtyard wall. Gudersky led his men in repelling the Germans, using the grenades to drive them into a confused retreat. Unfortunately, as Gudersky drove back a police unit, he was caught in the blast of his own grenade. He died instantly. Full command of the defense now fell on the shoulders of Alphonse Fliskowski. Of the post office's 100 employees, only 56 were present when the Germans attacked. This included the 10 reservists, but also the building's caretaker, his wife, and their 10-year-old daughter, Erwina. Despite their numerical disadvantage, Flisikowski kept morale up by reassuring his men that help would come. The original plan had been to hold out for six hours, by which time the Polish Pomeranian army would have time to mobilize and capture Danzig. While hopes were high inside, frustrations were of equal measure outside. The Germans were furious with the Polish resistance. Captain Bethke suggested using high explosives to bring the building down, but was overruled by Forster. The Gauleiter wanted his prize intact. At 11am, Wehrmacht reinforcements arrived, bringing a 105mm howitzer and two other artillery pieces. A renewed attack saw the building racked by heavy fire as the enraged Germans attempted another breakthrough, but the Poles stalled them, then forced them back once again. After this insult, Bethke ordered one of the mortars that were engaged at Westerplatte to rain hell on the post office, an idea that quickly turned into a farce, as the machine's faulty sights saw heavy rounds drop all over the square, endangering the Germans more than the besieged Poles. After this debacle, Forster gave a two-hour ceasefire, once again demanding the postman to surrender. It had now been ten hours since the start of the attack, and despite the declining morale, the Polish defenders refused. Fliskowski used the reprieve to check the wounded and reinforce the defences, but the Germans were playing for time. A team of sappers had started digging from below street level and had reached the building's foundation. They placed a heavy charge explosive and when they were clear, detonated it. The blast brought down one of the walls and sent shockwaves through the post office. In the confusion, the Germans had massed for a final assault. With a blast from the artillery pieces, the combined units stormed forward and surged into the building. Under such overwhelming fire, the Poles fell back to their last holdout in the basement. Now at their lowest and realizing that there would be no rescue, some considered surrendering, but most were willing to hold out. The German attack, however, never came. Instead, the Poles noticed the growing acrid stench of gasoline that began to fill the room. The Germans had no intention of a final costly assault, they wanted this farce over with quickly. Captain Bethke had ordered the Danzig Fire Brigade to pump gasoline into the officer's basement. Once done, they ignited the liquid. The Poles were forced to flee back upstairs as the flames filled the room. Three men were burned alive, while others suffered major injuries. Sitting in the crumbling ruin of the post office that they had fought so hard to defend, the postman decided to surrender. As sections of the building burned, the group was led out by Jan Mikon holding a white rag on the end of a stick. The Germans, thirsty for blood, shot him regardless. A second group was led out by Joseph Vosik. He too fell under the Teutonic fury, being immolated with a flamethrower. Six of the men escaped capture, with four evading the Germans for the remainder of the war. The rest were rounded up and imprisoned under the eye of the Gestapo, the feared Nazi secret police. The wounded were stuffed into an overcrowded hospital, where six of them would succumb to their wounds, including little Owena, who had been badly burned during the escape. A sham trial was quickly convened, and the Poles were naturally found guilty, being charged as illegal combatants and thus not protected by the Geneva Convention. On October the 5th, they were executed by an SS firing squad, their bodies dumped into a mass grave, covered over, and forgotten. Though the war would roll on into an inevitable German defeat, the memory of the last stand at the Polish post office would not be forgotten. Their heroic actions would take their place amongst the pantheon of brave last stands, such as the Battle of Wisna or the Warsaw Uprising, coming to symbolize the Polish people's refusal to submit to an invading enemy. The postman's 15-hour stand against overwhelming odds turned them into national heroes for the young republic. The statue now stands dedicated to their brave sacrifice just outside the very building they gave their lives to defend, forever remembered for their courage. A brave few who stood against many and lost, but in their own way now stand undefeated.